Kia ora koutou, no mai haere mai to tonight's webinar on facial dermatitis, acne, rosacea and more. The webinar tonight is supported by L'Oreal and La Roche-Posay. My name is Katie McCulloch, I'm a nurse practitioner who works in primary healthcare and for the Goodfellow Unit. Tonight's topic is focused mainly on practical advice on the diagnosis and management of facial dermatitis in primary care. Common conditions will be reviewed such as acne, rosacea, atopic eczema, seborrheic dermatitis and psoriasis. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Lisa Alvarez Connolly. She's a specialist dermatologist with over 15 years of experience. She specializes in treating all conditions related to the skin, hair and nails with additional interest and expertise in pediatric dermatology conditions. Currently, she's one of a handful of pediatric dermatologists in New Zealand and the only one in New Plymouth. All right, over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Katie. Thank you all for um, joining us tonight. And today's learning objectives are to discuss the pathogenesis of the most common causes of facial dermatitis. We're gonna discuss the skin microbiome and what the importance is of having homeostasis within it. We'll speak about ceramides and when these are deranged, how does that lead to facial dermatitis? We'll review clinical features of each of these conditions and then discuss management and best practices, including the role of skincare, and then open it up for your questions. So facial dermatitis, um, in its broadest sense, is an inflammatory condition affecting the face, and it can be triggered by many things, infection, various types of bacteria, fungus, mites, viruses, depending on which part of the body we're dealing with. Um, it could be due to an altered skin microbiome. It could be caused by irritants. We were all familiar with mask knee or that artificial occlusion that the healthcare workers were suffering during the pandemic. Gut dysbiosis, there's certainly a connection with certain facial dermatitis, um, derma dermatitis and um, gut dysbiosis. Hormones, this is seen mostly in puberty and then in women of all ages up until perimenopausal uh, times, and then allergens that create a true contact allergy. So these are all examples of, of facial dermatitis. These are all my patients. Um, and sometimes it can be confusing to tell one from the other. And so the goal of this webinar is to, is to break these down for you and give you an approach to help you make the right diagnosis. Because once you have, then that will dictate your management. And so we're gonna focus tonight on acne, on rosacea, and on eczema and a few of the eczema variants. And so before we go further, we really need to discuss normal versus disease skin. We really need an appropriately functioning microbiome and epidermal barrier in complete homeostasis to have what we've considered normal skin. If you lose that barrier, if you have dysbiosis, you will develop a dysregulation of the immune system, an inflammatory response, and classically what we see with atopic eczema. However, it isn't the only disease. We know that in acne and in rosacea and in variants of eczema, this is also the case. So the skin microbiome is playing a role. And if the epidermis um, and the epidermal barrier breaks down, it will contribute to, to the disease. And in some cases, if the disease is quite mild, if you just correct the skin barrier and you correct the dysbiosis, that's enough to improve patients' symptoms and their signs. And it's in moderate and severe disease that you then require prescription medication along with proper skin care. So before we go any further, let's look at the skin anatomy and then focus specifically on the epidermis. So the skin is composed of three main layers, the epidermis, which is the, the top uh, uppermost layer, the dermis, which is the middle layer that contains all of the organelles and, and key features such as sweat glands and hair follicles um, and oil glands, as well as erector pili muscles, vasculature and the nerves. And then we have the subcutaneous fat. And what we're going to focus on today is on the epidermis and specifically the stratum corneum, which is the uppermost layer of the epidermis. And that is what interfaces with the world. And we think of the stratum corneum as the brick wall uh, with a brick and a mortar system. So the bricks are the corneocytes or the keratinocytes that have differentiated into um, keratinocytes that have lost their nucleus, and then we call them corneocytes, um, and a lipid-rich layer that binds those corneocytes together. 
Um, and these, these layers are full of flagrin, which is a protein that about 20 years ago um, was a very hot topic in dermatology because it explained, or at least gave us one genetic explanation for atopic eczema and what we used to know as the outside in model for atopic eczema, meaning that if you had a genetic predisposition for an altered skin barrier, that that could lead to the clinical signs and symptoms of atopic eczema. And it turns out flagrin is very important in aggregating keratinocytes, in producing, in producing natural moisturizing factor and really maintaining the homeostasis of the epidermal barrier. And so within that mortar, what we have is a very complex interaction between different lipids, ceramides making, most, making up most of that at about 50%, 25% is cholesterol, and then 10% fatty acids and other, and other acids. And they create this very uh, lipid-rich um, lamellar bilayer um, which, which sustains that mortar. Um, and interestingly and not surprisingly, um, the overall levels of ceramides in, the, in these lipids are reduced in patients with atopic eczema, not just in lesional skin, but non-lesional skin. And ceramides are important because they're going to help us not only with the barrier function, but they're going to help with barrier repair. They're gonna create that lipid envelope that is so important, um, but their levels, are susceptible to seasonal change. And I'm sure you've all met patients that say, as soon as the season changes, as soon as we go into, into winter, my skin sets off. Well, this is why. Um, we see it with aging, we see it in atopic eczema, psoriasis, um, and other conditions. And why, why is this lipid bilayer so important? The reason is because when these ceramides are not being produced or expressed at the appropriate amounts, it leads to loss of water through the skin or what we call transepidermal water loss. Um, and this has been shown in atopic eczema, in acne and psoriasis, and in other forms of, of eczema, such as um, dermatitis, irritant dermatitis, contact dermatitis. And specifically when it comes to ceramides and acne, Acne, what we see is this transepidermal water loss and the ceramide imbalances can be susceptible to changes in hormones. Um, and if that leads to an epidermal barrier dysfunction, that can precede acne. And, in, and to make matters worse, as you start to treat acne, you can even exacerbate the epidermal barrier dysfunction. So as we move on to the microbiome, what we've learned in, in the last um, decade is that it is a very complex interplay between different organisms, bacteria making up the most, um, and which bacteria is expressed in the skin is going to depend on the location. So oily skin will have a, a greater richness in species. It'll, it'll um, have more propionobacteria and more staphylococci, such as what you would see in acne. Um, moist skin will have more coriny bacteria. Um, and you'll see this in, in the toe web spaces. You can see this in the umbilicus. Um, and dry skin areas will have less um, species richness um, and will favor more proteobacteria. And I think this concept of, of, a, of a microbiome and a microbiome dysbiosis really isn't new. If you think about how common intertrigo is in um, infancy, we're all very familiar with that, that macerated erythema in the folds, usually in the neck, uh, in the axilla, um, in, in the inguinal folds of infants, especially the really chubby, healthy babies. Um, and so it isn't until they grow a neck, it isn't until those extremities lengthen that these folds are then able to um, have more circulating um, air and less buildup of moisture. And so classically within a trigo, what you see is a buildup of yeast. So we always think of, of candida. Um, contributing or causing the, the intertrigo. But more recently, what we've seen is a shift to staph and strep also contributing um, to, to this type of disease, which would make sense based on what our microbiome concept is telling us. And so very simplistically, this was an article that was published um, just last year, and it was looking at the role of the epidermal barrier dysfunction and the microbiome with relations to acne and rosacea. And, and what I like about this diagram is that it expands our view of what the stratum corneum is, is doing. Um, and we discussed the physical layers of that stratum corneum where you have corneocytes and you have this very rich lipid bilayer made up of ceramides and fatty acids, um, and you have nice tight junctions that are meant to keep the integrity of the skin. 
But more importantly, we're learning that there is a chemical layer and that chemical layer is made up of natural moisturizing factor. It's made up of lipids and of, of the innate immune system. So these canthalocytins, um, these um, beta defensins and antimicrobial peptides are our first layer of protection against the pathogens. Um, and I like that they've included the microbiome layer at the very top above the stratum corneum, because we can't ignore the fact that we've got commensal microorganisms that are sitting there and definitely playing a role in how the disease is going to progress. And when you have disruption of, um, of this epidermal barrier, instead of keeping harmful and environmental substances and irritants out, you then have this flow of these irritants and of, and of these toxins and of potential allergens in through the stratum corneum and making its way down through the epidermis and triggering an inflammatory response um, deeper in the skin. So let's move on to the um, individual diseases now and, and see how this is all interplaying. So acne vulgaris is a multifactorial inflammatory disease of the pyosebaceous unit. So it's going to involve the hair follicle and the sebaceous glands, as you can see here. So the sebaceous glands being number one in the diagram, they, they filter into the hair follicle and then make their way out onto the surface of the skin. So you start with activation of the sebaceous glands due to um, puberty and um, increasing circulating uh, uh, hormones, then that leads to hyperkeratinization or blockage of your pore so that you've got an overrepresentation of, um, of material and of oil within the sebaceous unit, leading to increasing dilatation and inflammation. Um, and what we clinically would, would um, diagnose as acne. So you have blackheads, whiteheads, papules, pustules. So the oiliness is coming from the increasing um, production from hormones. The retention is from the clogged pores leading to whiteheads and to blackheads. And then with that inflammatory response, you get the red painful pimples, papules, and very severe cases, cysts. And as we look at acne throughout the different ages, um, children can present quite young with acne. Um, what is normal is considered girls anywhere after nine years of age, boys sort of 10 to 11. Um, adolescence is where we classically see acne and then women mostly, um, I think overrepresentation of adult women more so than men, but it can progress into um, adulthood in men as well. But one key feature of acne, despite the age of the patient, is the presence of comedones. And I can't stress this enough. Comedones are blackheads. So blackheads, whiteheads. If you can see a dilated pore, that's a blackhead. If you can't see the dilated pore and it's covered with skin, um, then that's what we would define as a whitehead. That is integral to the diagnosis. Sometimes I'll see children with classic acne. So I see comedones, I see whiteheads, I see blackheads, I see papules, I see pustules, and they'll come to me with a diagnosis of perioral dermatitis because maybe they're eight or nine and the GP just can't get around to making the diagnosis. But if you see comedones, that is acne. It's not perioral dermatitis, it's not rosacea, that is acne. Um, and that's important because it will dictate how you manage these patients. Now, um, as I mentioned previously, this is a study showing that um, ceramide levels are indeed reduced um, in patients um, with acne and in acne lesions. And this is regardless of whether they're being treated or not. And they have increased transepidermal water loss. Um, and this is a very difficult concept for patients to, to, to accept. So they come in here with greasy skin and with acne, and I'm saying to them, you know what? Yes, it's greasy on the surface, but underlying, your skin is dry. Um, and so we're going to treat you, but I also need you to start using a moisturizer. And it does take a while to get their heads wrapped around this concept. Usually they have to start the treatment, feel that dryness eventually, and then we can get them on board. Um, and interestingly, it isn't just the, the, the um, coronibacterium acnes that is playing a role in acne, but actually an interplay between staph epidermis and C. acnes. So the staph is on the surface, the C. acnes is in the hair follicle in the spacious unit, and there is an interplay and definitely an increase in inflammation based on the presence of, of this bacteria. And so this is what I was mentioning before, um, but I wanted to just stress the point that there are some mimickers of acne 
um, rosacea, for example, where you will have pus pustules and papules, but you will not have comedones. Folliculitis, where you just have um, monomorphic pustules uh, in an area. It doesn't always have to be symmetric, whereas acne or rosacea tend to be very symmetric. Folliculitis can be quite focal and spread within an area. Keratosis pilaris can look a bit pustular, but actually these are spiny pustules, um, that spiny papules that are actually due to congestion of hair follicles, and they tend to occur on the lateral aspect um, of the face with relative sparing of the central face. And then milia, which are actually small cysts, but again, you will not see pustules and papules in this condition. You'll just see what looks like deep whiteheads. And so we could be very very um, nitpicky when it comes to classifying acne, but I'm gonna simplify this for you and really just want you to think about it as mild, moderate, or severe. Mild acne is going to be predominantly comedonal, whiteheads, blackheads, with a few inflammatory papules. Moderate will have a, an equal representation of both. And severe is going to have more cystic nodular, um, cystic lesions, deeper papules um, with sometimes quite dramatic open uh, and closed comedones, um, but it's the inflammation, the biolaceous um, hue to the lesions and actually the, the, the deformity that gives it its, um, its classification. So how do I approach a patient um, with acne? The first thing to learn about is what are they actually doing for their acne at present? Um, and please do not dismiss over-the-counter products because we are seeing a rise in the availability of over-the-counter products for acne with quite active ingredients that are playing a role. Um, I had a patient the other day that was using a cleanser, a toner, and a cream that all contained 2% um, salicylic acid. So she was using the same ingredient in three different skincare products. Um, and so to have missed that and given her prescription strength acne treatment would have sent her skin on a tailspin and really caused um, quite severe epidermal barrier dysfunction. So it's important to get a good history from the patients. And I really ask them everything. What is, what is in your bathroom? What is in your shower? What is by the sink? What do you use in the morning? What do you use when, in the evenings? Um, and, and try to detail that as much as possible. Um, um, and then recommend a product that is non-comedogenic, non-acnegenic. Um, if a patient is, is working with a beauty therapist or with a skin clinic, um, it's really important to know what exactly they're using. And then when you do make your recommendations for treatment, I would urge your patients um, to share that with their beauty therapist and skin clinic, um, because if you have conflicting um, treatments, it will derail your, your, um, the efficacy of, of your treatment regimen. Um, most women with acne will not have a hormone imbalance. However, you can have circulating androgens that can play a role. Um, and that is why um, DHT or dihydrotestosterone um, inhibitors are quite useful in the treatment of acne, and we'll get to that um, later. But if your patient has hirsutism, if they're obese, or if they have signs of insulin resistance, if they have menstrual irregularities, it is important to rule out polycystic ovarian syndrome. So refer them to their GP um, if, if you are in a, um, in, in a pharmacy setting. Um, and if you are a GP, then, then if you're seeing these signs and symptoms, then please work your patients up accordingly, because um, you'd hate to miss this and the metabolic syndrome that. Um, that goes with it. There is an emotional and social impact to acne that I don't think that we should ignore. Um, I often find that um, it's hard for patients with severe acne to make good eye contact. Um, they, you know, they come in with a downtrodden uh, stare, and as their acne improves, they sort of blossom, and you get better eye contact and an overall um, um, confidence that comes with clearing up their acne. And then the last thing is, is to not ignore is their occupation and leisure activities. Um, you know, patients that work um, in, you know, that are exposed to steam or oil if they're in a kitchen, um, if, if they're working with industrial oils, if they're working in, a pool, in, in swimming pools with lots of chlorine and increased um, um, exposure to irritants, this will affect them. If they're in hot, human environments, that will uh, play a role and certainly help coworkers with prolonged, prolonged um, mass use. 
So the approach to acne really needs to be multifactorial. So we need to address the sebum production. We need to address the, the clogged pores. We need to address the bacteria that is playing a role in this. Um, and our goals are very simple. So we wanna resolve these existing lesions. We wanna prevent new lesion formation because a child that is prone to acne will have acne throughout puberty. So you can treat them at 13, but just know that for the next three to four years, they're probably gonna be dealing with fluctuations in hormones. Um, and so this isn't going to be a quick fix. Um, and then lastly, not ignore any psychological stress that can be associated with it. Um, I think the two photos that I've shown you here is of one of my patients. The, on, on the, leash, the photo on top is how she presented to me with predominantly comedonal acne. The, lesion, uh, the photo at the bottom is exactly 30 days later. Um, and while it's subtle, what you, can, what you see though is you see this transition from a pre predominantly comedonal acne to now an acne that is presenting with pap papules and with pustules. Um, and if you don't warn your patients, if you don't create the expectation that the acne will be worse or will be more obvious in the first month after treatment, what often happens is patients are discouraged, they think that it's not working and they get up. So um, important, one, one key important um, message is that all acne studies for topical treatment are done over a three month period. And so your, those before and after pictures that, that everyone is using to, to convince us that this is an effective treatment is really after three months of daily use. No one's going to show you the photo at four weeks and much less at six weeks because all patients look worse during that time. And, and the answer and the reason for it is very simple. It's plumbing. You have clogged pores. It all has to come out to the surface. You have to clean out that pore and then you continue using the treatment so that you can maintain um, an, an open pilosebaceous unit and then prevent the buildup from reoccurring. Um, and when it comes to treatment, I really don't have any secrets. Everything that I use is on this slide. Um, if it's very early onset acne, you can use over-the-counter products quite successfully. Um, and you now have access to um, whole product lines where you have a cleanser, you have an active ingredient, and you have a moisturizer and a sunscreen that makes it quite easy, especially for that prepubescent um, mild acne. As the disease progresses and you start to deal with more papules and pustules, then you can start adding combination treatments where you can have a prescription topical retinoid by itself um, that in addition to proper skincare regimen is usually enough, but again, give patients three to six months before they're going to see significant improvement. You can combine a topical retinoid with topical benzoyl peroxide. This comes as a prescription medication, also um, goes by the name of um, Epiduo, and it's in a metered pump, which helps to prevent patients from overusing product. Um, you can certainly move on to um, oral tetracyclines. Um, doxycycline is a mainstay of treatment, um, or oral isotretinoin um, in more severe um, cases. Um, I, for women with adult onset acne, I do use quite a bit of spironolactone because it is a um, DHT or dihydrotestosterone inhibitor. Um, and up until now, we really have not been able to use these types of drugs in men, but um, there are two um, topical spironolactone and a topical clascoderone available in the US and hopefully available in New Zealand. Um, I don't know when that will be, but that will allow us to treat men with a topical formulation to address the DHT, which also plays a role in the more papulopustural formation. So we choose what our prescription medication is going to be. Are we prescribing a topical retinoid? Are we going to prescribe a combination of topical retinoid with a benzoyl peroxide? Um, are we going to combine that with an oral antibiotic if it's a patient with moderate disease that is, that is progressing to developing papules and pustules? Or are we treating them with oral isotretinoin. Regardless of how we're choosing our prescription medication, we have to make sure that they are using skincare that is not competing with our prescription medications. And so what we want the skincare to do is to cleanse the skin, to remove any makeup or any debris that would, you know, has accumulated throughout the day. Um, and then we want to contribute to repairing the epidermal barrier um, in case they are suffering from any irritation from the acne products. And it is quite common to suffer irritation from acne products. 
Um, again, you know, they, they're meant to be keratolytics. They're meant to open up those pores and to cause that superficial peeling. And so then we're repairing that with the use of our moisturizers. Um, and then we have to be we have to be very certain that they're not sabotaging your reg regimen with any irritants, um, salicylic acid, glycolic acid, or an, any other AHA acids in their um, over-the-counter products. The messaging is getting out there and it's all over social media. Patients are listening to what the influencers are using. There's quite, quite a bit of direct marketing. Um, and I'm amazed by how well-versed our patients can be even at very early ages um, in what skincare they should be using or has been recommended to them by their favorite influencers on, on social media. So you have to personalize it and tailor it to the acne, um, to their acne and what is gonna work best for them. So again, key ingredients such as um, an acidic pH, so a cleanser that's going to be more on the acidic side. You want a moisturizer that is low occlusive, so more water versus an oil-based moisturizer. You want a sunscreen that is going to be non-comedogenic. Um, and then you can have added ingredients such as niacinamide, zinc, alpha hydroxy acid, ceramides, um, if you're comfortable using products with these ingredients that are going to help repair that epidermal factor. Um, you want to avoid oil-based makeups, at least on a daily basis. Um, you want to use, uh, avoid occlusive oil-based moisturizers, definitely avoid scrubs um, and any irritating cleansers. Um, I can't stress this enough. There is no role for dermablading, microneedling, or fractionated lasers for patients with active acne lesions. If your patients have um, papules, pustules, and deep comedones, you should not be damaging the skin with any of these treatments. You can actually make the condition worse. Once the acne is under control, if they have some textural scarring, that's when these, these um, devices can play a role. So let's troubleshoot. So you started your patient on what you deem to be appropriate treatment. They're coming in three months later and they're saying, well, it didn't work. That's where you need to break it down and say, well, exactly what happened. So how often, how often and how long did you use the um, topical keratolytic or how long did you use the retinoid? What happened immediately after you use it? Um, were you using proper skincare along with it? Um, oftentimes, I, I find that I have a very highly motivated parent and, and, and not as motivated patient. Um, and, and, and it's important to point that out to the families that, that the patient needs to be on board. Um, and once they're motivated, then it's easy because they, they will then carry out um, the um, necessary steps to improvement. So the more motivated your patient, the more they will adhere to treatment. Um, but even with the best of intentions and the most motivated patients, if you have progression of the disease, especially in the setting of a strong family history of acne, then that's when you need to step up your prescription uh, treatment. Um, if they're only on topicals, then I would advance to oral antibiotics. Um, and if they fail that, then I would advance to oral um, retinoids or isotretinoin. Um, my threshold for using oral antibiotics is um, after six months. Uh, what you'll find is that you put patients on oral doxycycline and their acne improves, but it only works if they're on the oral antibiotics. There is no cure from oral doxycycline. However, if you can get them onto an oral retinoid, then you've got over 85% cure if you give them the proper course. And that course is going to depend on um, the milligrams per kilo. I use anywhere between 120 to 130 milligrams per kilo total dose, or you can dose it by clinical response, which is that you dose for um, as long as it takes to achieve two months without a single breakout. And if you're dosing it at 10 to 15 milligrams per day, that can easily take you between 12 and 18 months to achieve. And the last warning when it comes to um, treating acne is beware of your atopic patient with acne. Um, it is a seesaw. So the more aggressive you are with their topical acne treatment, the more vigorously you will bring out their atopic eczema. And so I find that these patients are sometimes best treated with oral medication and I will put them on oral isotretinoin because I find that I can manage the irritation much more reliably um, 
in, in, in cases where I can control their daily dose, as opposed to leaving it to how much of the retinoid they're applying on any given day. If they're having to squeeze it out of a tube, that can vary greatly. It'll also vary um, based on where they start um, applying it on their face. So I will sometimes recommend that if they're using a, a topical retinoid, that they squeeze it onto their fingertips, no more than a pea size amount. They rub it between the fingertips, start on the forehead, work their way down. They're usually T-zone first um, and then head out towards the sides of the face. Try to avoid the um, squeezing and dabbing. So that is where they, they squeeze a, a pea size amount, put it on one area, squeeze again, put it here. And in the end, they've used four times as much as what they needed to use. And then they'll see you in three months and say, it didn't work. I was too dry. This is why. So really break it down for them and make it as easy as you can so that they can ad adhere to the treatment. So I just wanted to bring up keratosis pilaris because this can sometimes be confused with early acne. Um, and this is a dry skin condition. It's actually a variant of atopic eczema. Um, you'll see it on the lateral cheeks, as you can see on the photo um, uh, on the left. Um, it can usually um, also present very commonly on the outer arms or outer upper arms and the anterior thighs. And this is occlusion of the hair follicles, um, but you do not develop the papules and the pustules that you would see with acne. Um, also, the T-zone is spared, which it would be very difficult to make a diagnosis of acne if you didn't have involvement of the forehead and the central face. Um, and, and so this is the 3 and 13 rule. So you usually see this flare in toddlers, usually about three years of age, and then again um, in, in um, puberty at around age 13. Um, there is good over-the-counter treatment for this, low-dose salicylic acid, um, and it comes in cleansers and, and in cream form. And so they can just leave it in the shower, hydrate, uh, or use the medicated cleanser and then apply the moisturizer once they're out of the shower. And the erythema does respond nicely to um, V-beam or pulse dye laser, um, which I do offer. So let's move on to rosacea. Um, and these are two of my patients. Um, and you can see how the disease can vary. It's one disease looking completely different in two different patients. One showing more erythema and the other showing more papular pustules with a bit of scarring. So rosacea is a chronic relapsing facial skin condition in the setting of sensitive skin. It'll affect between five to 10% of the population. Classically, they will present with these um, follicular papules and pustules, central face with involvement of the nose, um, sometimes periocular, but very importantly, no comedones. Um, it can be seen in all skin types. I think there's an overrepresentation of Caucasian um, women, but I think this is from a reporting bias. I certainly see quite a few Asian patients in my practice uh, with rosacea. Um, genetic factors are at play, um, but it is characterized by inflammation and vasculopathy. So this, this dilatation, this flushing that comes with the condition, um, and in some cases, a gut dysbiosis, there can be overlap with perioreficial dermatitis. So you have a dysregulation of the immune system that changes the nerves, it changes the vascular response leading to flushing. And classically, we think of four subtypes. Um, I showed you two subtypes previously, but we have the four here, where you have the facial redness, the telangiectatic or, or erythematous um, rosacea, you have the papillopustular rosacea, you have the rhinophyma, where you have the um, uh, sort of engorgement or dilatation and growth of the nose, and then ocular rosacea, which usually requires oral treatment to, to really um, uh, manage effectively. Um, and when it comes to rosacea, usually if you ask the question, you will find the answer. And that is um, patients with rosacea are usually intolerant to most skincare regimens. And so they'll come in saying, I've had to give up everything and all I can do is tolerate water. And even sometimes when I rinse with water, my skin burns. And so this is a chicken and an egg a situation where we don't know if the rosacea caused the irritant dermatitis or if there was an irritant dermatitis that then led to the rosacea. But certainly these two go hand in hand. And so you cannot effectively treat rosacea without addressing the elephant in the room, which is that, ir that irritant dermatitis and barrier dysfunction. And so I make it really simple in that first visit to say my goal is to find a, a simple skincare regimen that you will be able to use on a daily basis. And all I need you to do is be able to cleanse your face, to moisturize it, 
and then eventually apply a moisturizer, uh, apply a sunscreen, I'm sorry. And sometimes it does take a while before we can get them to the point that they can, they can tolerate um, a proper sunscreen. And that is because this irritant dermatitis is leading to increased water loss. They have lost the hydration of the skin. They have an altered pH. Um, they will have a very quick stinging reaction to items that wouldn't irritate a normal um, individual with normal skin. And that is interpreted as itch, burn, stinging, and immediate redness. So like I said, first goal is find a non-irritating regimen that they can tolerate. And second, you're managing the, their rosacea. Um, and this is a study that showed um, the importance of um, proper skin care in addition to prescription medications when, when treating rosacea. Um, so what are the triggers? Um, Demodex is a mite that is found in the pilosebaceous unit, and it is found to be overrepresented in the hair follicles of patients with rosacea. Um, I can actually extract the, um, the sebum and, and, the, and, and the purulent material from the pustules um, and look under the microscope and find the demodex um, in these patients. Um, oftentimes I have done biopsies that have come back and shown an overexpression of demodex within the hair follicle um, unit. Um, there is a specific bacteria uh, called Bacillus uh, oleroneus, which um, grows within the demodex. So there's that interplay between these two organisms. We have Staph epidermidis that is found in the pustules, and then we have um, C. acnes as well. And what's interesting is that if we treat our rosacea patients with anti-mite treatment, so topical ivermectin, topical metronidazole. Um, I use quite a bit of topical permethrin because it's cheap and it's accessible and it's available. Um, we can, we can um, successfully treat the, the demodex folliculitis and, and the, the pustule, pustular formation associated with rosacea. Um, and interestingly, if you treat the gut microbiome. So patients that were treated for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or SIBO with rifaximin, found they completely cleared in their rosacea. So while this is not a causation, there is definitely a correlation between an altered skin microbiome and demodex and rosacea and an altered gut microbiome and rosacea. So um, as I mentioned, because of the, the uh, associated irritation um, in patients with rosacea, what we find is that patients cannot tolerate toners, soaps, exfoliating agents, certain makeups, perfumes, moisturizers, hairsprays, shampoos, um, and the, they are severely irritated from um, silica-based products, or if you're using any type of retinoid, benzoyl peroxides, urea, they will certainly flare. So that is why it's important to make that distinction between acne and rosacea, because acne treatment will flare rosacea um, quite significantly. Um, and this was a study looking at patients in China with rosacea and found that um, they had an overrepresentation of using excessive facial cleansers. They were using masks. They were using um, makeup more often. They were frequenting beauty salons and using beauty salon products um, more so than patients who didn't have rosacea. So again, whether that preceded their rosacea or, or what the actual um, um, association is, we don't, we don't truly know, but we know that it plays a role. Um, and this is a list of how, how to manage rosacea. For the persistent erythema, um, I have tried topical um, uh, bromonidine. Actually, I have not found it to be very helpful. Um, I find that um, B-beam and pulsed eye laser, which I do have access to in my clinic, is extremely helpful in treating the erythema, the papillopustules, and the telangiectasias. Um, and I also find that oral doxycycline at, at 100 milligrams as we have available in New Zealand, and minocycline um, in 100 milligrams is very, very effective in, in managing rosacea. Um, and if I find that I can't, um, if, if they cannot come off the oral medication without flaring, then I will switch them on to very low dose isotretinoin in the five to 10 milligram daily dose. Um, and I find that this works quite nicely too for um, rhinophyma. Um, if they're not uh, candidates for um, surgical treatment. Um, we do have access to topical ivermectin. It has to be compounded and it's very expensive, which is why I use quite a bit of topical permethrin. Um, I use it once a day um, to the affected areas and they will use it for 
um, three months. I usually find that within that time frame, that's enough to settle the papular pustules, um, and then we can move on um, to more um, restorative care without having to continue using it. So we have um, skin care has to have gentle cleanser, so what they can tolerate. Um, a very simple, tolerable moisturizer, and then sunscreen. I find that um, the tinted sunscreens with zinc and titanium are often better tolerated than the um, the combination sunscreens where you have chemical and, and, and physical blockers. Um, but it is important to get them on a proper sunscreen because um, UV light can sometimes trigger um, rosacea symptoms as well. Um, and then again, just stay clear of moisturizers that have too many active ingredients. Um, this is the condition where it's fine to have ceramides, um, but I wouldn't use a very rich moisturizer that is full of any AHAs or vitamin Cs or hyaluronic acids um, initially. Until you can manage the rosacea, I would stay away from using those active ingredients. Once their skin has normalized, then you can start adding them one at a time and avoid using things that are, are too oil rich because sometimes that can feed rosacea. And this is my patient um, after six months of um, minocycline and uh, topical permethrin, three months. Um, she continued with minocycline for a further three months and then one session of VB laser. And she is very, very happy. She's now off all um, medications, uh, is washing her face once a day, moisturizing and sunscreen. So in summary, you want... Um, you want to stay clear of things that are going to further derange your skin barrier function and dysbiosis. You want a, um, a cleanser and a, and, and a moisturizer that is going to hydrate the skin with an acidic pH that is full of ceramides, but not too um, oil rich. Um, you want it to be a very simple regimen um, and you want to avoid excessive active ingredients um, and certainly avoid topical steroids because the use of topical steroids in patients with rosacea can then um, create a granulomatous subtype or a periorificial type of dermatitis, which is much more difficult um, to manage and to treat. And like acne, you want to avoid dermabrasion, microneedling, lading, anything that is um, actively mechanically disrupting the skin because it will further trigger rosacea. Now, I'm not gonna do eczema justice. I only have a few minutes, but I just wanted to touch base. Um, so you're all familiar with facial eczema. You usually see this predominantly in um, infants and, um, and toddlers. It is a chronic uh, dermatitis with red patches over the cheeks. Interestingly, it will avoid, it will, it will spare the T-zone and be more on the lateral aspects um, of the face. Um, it's exacerbated by teething and salivation that will certainly drive it and will um, dry, um, contribute to the irritation um, and the skin barrier dysfunction. And it is extremely itchy. It can present at any age though. I find that um, women, especially 20s, 30s, 40s, will commonly come in with a periocular um, eczema that can be quite challenging. Um, and in this case, we expand our differential, not just to irritants and products that they might be using, but to a true contact allergy in addition to atopic eczema. Um, eczema does change based on age. Um, as I said, in infants and toddlers, you will just see convex uh, uh, surfaces moving more to, to um, concave, so the antecubital folds, the popliteal um, folds in children and adolescents. And then in adulthood, Yes, it can, it can um, be in those locations, but I find that chronic adult eczema is really an entity all on its own and can be anywhere on the body, certainly with a much more facial um, uh, predilection. And so this is a good schematic to review, again, not only the pathogenesis of atopic eczema, but the interplay between barrier dysfunction and the skin microbiome. And what you're seeing here is the epidermis, and you're seeing how this epidermis is being uh, disrupted by the, um, the, the, the features that lead to atopic eczema. So we start with an abnormal barrier. Um, this increases the pH of the skin. We start to have transepidermal water loss. In addition to that, we have staph aureus bacteria that is just sitting on the surface in that microbiome layer that I showed you. It then creates a biofilm um, that starts to release toxin and that is being absorbed into that disrupted epidermis. 
we have decreased amounts of antimicrobial peptides, which are meant to be in that chemical layer and being our first line of defense against this toxin. Well, they're not there in the, in the, in the amount that they need to be. And so then these toxins are going to be dri driven deeper into the skin. They're going to activate those longer hand cells or those antigen presenting cells. They're gonna drive the cytokine response within the keratinocytes. And then we're going to lead to this TH2 differentiated response where we have increased in IgE, we have an increase in eosinophils, and an increase in CL17. And this is what then leads to what we would classically define as an examiner's patch in a patient. So the reason for this is multifactorial, um, and we used to think of it as a chicken and an egg. So was it an immune-mediated dysfunction that led to the epidermal dysfunction or vice versa? And the truth is both are true. So you can start from a purely genetic and epidermal, epidermal barrier um, dysfunction, such as with a pelagrin mutation, with decreased ceramide production, um, or you could start with a purely immune-mediated dysfunction. Think of those genodermatoses um, such as hyper-IgE syndrome, such as Netherton syndrome, these, these conditions where you have full body eczema and full body immune dysfunction. So those are patients that have a primary, primary immune dysfunction that then leads to breakdown of the skin barrier and classically with very severe eczema. So both of those are true and both of those can cause what we think of as clinical eczema um, and they're lying somewhere along a spectrum. So we have increased transepidermal water loss, we have increase of allergens, um, we have um, loss of an ideal water content in the stratum corneum, and if you lose less than 10% of that, you will have symptomatic skin, that dryness, the scaling, the rough patches, that will lead to itching, that will lead to scratching, and then a worsening of the epidermal barrier. And this is looking at ceramide content in patients with eczema, and I alluded to this earlier, um, stating that you have decreased um, ceramides in both lesional and non-lesional skin. Um, so that is why it's so important that when our patients are using um, a moisturizer, if they have eczema, they need to use that moisturizer everywhere. It goes on all over. And then your active prescription ingredients are going to go on to active lesional skin. I will usually have them um, apply the prescription product first, and then the moisturizer goes on over and it goes on everywhere. So beyond um, topical skincare with eczema, we, we are often um, prescribing topical steroids for um, we've got calcineurin inhibitors now available in New Zealand, um, and that is pimacrolimus and tacrolimus, and they are game changers. So they allow us to manage at least facial dermatitis um, much more effectively um, than we have been able to in the past. And that is because, as you all know, a patient comes in with eczema, you um, uh, prescribe a topical corticosteroid, they will use it for the five to seven days that you've recommended that they use it, they stop using it, and then they will flare within a few days. And the reason is because we don't always know what is triggering it. We don't always get to the bottom of what is triggering it. And this is a chronic condition. And so we are desperate for finding um, products that will help maintain the clearance that we achieve with topical steroids. And that's where these calcineurin inhibitors come in. There's good data and research to show that there's a role for them in, 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 in this regard. And so classically, what I recommend is using a topical steroid um, to manage the flare, then five, seven days of treatment until they're clear, and then introducing the calcineurin inhibitor to be used either daily for about a week and then two to three times a week, even if they're clear to maintain the skin and prevent a reflare. Um, in the US, we can use these calcium inhibitors on the body as well. In New Zealand, due to funding, it were limited to a very small tube, and so it just isn't enough to go around, but you could potentially be using it in those places if cost wasn't uh, an issue. Um, if patients um, progress beyond topical treatment, then we're looking into phototherapy for those that have access to phototherapy across the country, um, or we're looking into systemic immunosuppressive uh, agents. Our first line in New Zealand is methotrexate, um, and this can be used in children as well. In fact, um, it was Diana Purvis, a pediatric dermatologist at Starship, um, that has been the one really um, leading the um, or, or creating the guidelines um, for managing patients with methotrexate um, in this way.
Um, we also have um, systemic corticosteroids, although we, we save those for very severe flares, they should not be used for chronic management of, of, of atopic eczema. Um, and then beyond that, we have cyclosporin, azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil. Uh, I don't think that they work well, well enough. Um, sometimes we have no other choice but to prescribe them. My issue with cyclosporin is that you are limited to one year of use. I have seen patients with chronic renal disease because of overuse of cyclosporin in the management of their atopic eczema. Um, and that really um, should not be the case. Um, what is new in the pipeline? We've had dupilumab in the country, but we don't have access to it. It's not um, it's not subsidized by Pharmac for atopic eczema. Um, the newest kid on the block are JAK inhibitors, um, JAK inhibitors, um, UPA um, UPA Decitinib, it's a mouthful, also known as Rinvoc. That is available in New Zealand, but not indicated for eczema um, as of yet. Um, there are some clinical studies going on um, out of um, Waikato, uh, but otherwise um, only patients who have um, the means to afford it, it, it it's about um, $1,700 a month. Uh, and uh, so, uh, unless patients have um, prescription coverage, it is not readily available. But it is a game changer in the sense that it will control itch in patients that respond within 24 to 48 hours. So, watch the space. Um, I'm hoping that we will have access um, to um, this drug and others like it uh, at least in the next couple of years. Um, and then we have to be back back to basics. So make sure that they're not using any irritants, that they're not using bubble bath, um, that they're not using soaps with very high pH, um, that they are using cotton clothing and not anything that is too abrasive, um, that you've removed the obvious allergens, the preservatives, the fragrances. Um, if they have a known food allergen that is relevant, then, you know, that, that, it should be considered um, as assured environmental factors. So periocular dermatitis can be triggered or made worse by a severe house dust mite allergy. Um, and so in patients where that is the case, then we recommend dust mite precautions. Um, if they're allergic to their pet and they have a severe allergy to their pet, that can sometimes manifest as an eyelid dermatitis because the skin on the eyelids is very thin and so it can trigger it. I find that pollens is a, um, a very common reason for eyelid dermatitis, especially with the change in season. So fall and spring, are notorious for patients coming in with island dermatitis. And when you ask, do you have hay fever? Do you suffer from um, seasonal allergies? The answer is always yes. So get those patients on antihistamines preceding the change in season and you will prevent the island dermatitis. Um, and then lastly, the microbiome. Um, so if it's somebody who is continuously infected, we need to address that. Um, I, I do recommend bleach bathing. Um, and this is because it does play a role with biofilm formation. Uh, and does help in, in the management of patients who are um, chronically colonized with spa. So I find facial eczema very easy to treat, but challenging to manage. So I can make patients better, but how do I keep them clear? And that is where the art comes in, and we have to look at all the different variables. Um, they sometimes will require allergy testing, as I mentioned, dust allergy, um, you know, or at least make that correlation with um, pollens and seasonal allergy. Um, allergens, you don't necessarily have to test them, but just make sure that they're using their antihistamines correctly. Um, if it's a patient where you've exhausted everything, then please refer them to dermatology because we can patch test them and we can roll out a contact dermatitis. Um, I recently, um, I, I have seen patients be allergic to fragrances. I have seen them be allergic to preservatives and in very, very rare occasions, even patients allergic to the type of hydrocortisone that they were using. Um, use the non-steroidals to your advantage. You have access to tecrolimus and pimicrolimus. It does require a specialist, um, special authority, but once they have that, then the GPs can keep prescribing it over a lifetime if it's beneficial for their facial eczema. Um, tecrolimus is, um, author is, is um, you can have special authority for facial eczema and pimicrolimus is for eyelid dermatitis. And just make sure that they're on a skincare regimen that is going to be an adjuvant and supportive of your prescription medication, um, that they're not using products that are causing immediate stinging, itching, and burning because this can sometimes sabotage your treatment. Um, definitely keep it simple. I think less is more. 
And so to summarize the entire talk, um, skin barrier um, dysfunction definitely plays a role in multiple um, facial dermatitides. Um, the microbiome is incredibly important and, and obtaining that homeostasis is going to go a very long way to achieving the type of cure that our patients are after. Just make sure that what they were using is not going to um, derail um, them from the management that you, the path that you have set them on. Um, and, um, and that's it. So we are open for questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. That was an incredible talk and extremely interesting. I think I'm going to have to watch it again just so I can really absorb it all. Um, would you um, mind just touching briefly on perioral dermatitis? Um, it is seen quite often in primary care and, and people do get variable responses to it and management of it. So would, would you mind just touching briefly on that? You can think of it as a variant of rosacea. Uh, it usually is triggered by something. So what I find is um, patients come in with what is thought to be a, a dermatitis. They're treated with a topical steroid. They then overuse the topical steroid that probably contributes to the dysbiosis and the change in, in the hair follicle microbiome. And that predisposes them to perioral dermatitis. I think it is best treated orally. These patients respond very, very well to, to oral antibiotics, um, but it takes a long time, it, it, minimum six months of oral antibiotics um, before you could start weaning them off. Um, and then I really scale back what their topical regimen is, um, just make sure that they're on a very simple, gentle cleanser, um, that they're using a simple moisturizer if they need it, um, and that they're using sunscreen. And in my hands, that's usually enough. Um, it's it's the other thing is that um, periorificial dermatitis will flare if they've been using a topical steroid leading up to your diagnosis and treatment. So they come in to see you, they're using a topical steroid or overusing it or misusing it. Um, sometimes it's a quite strong topical steroid. So in that in that moderate to um, so high, mild to moderate potency. Um, and so you have them stop it overnight. You put them on the oral antibiotic. You have to prepare them. They will flare. And that is part of it. And they have to sit on their hands and they have to be okay with it. Um, oftentimes I will cheat and use a little bit of pimacrolimus in these patients just to ride the tide. Um, mm -hmm. But eventually over the next, over the first two to three weeks with the oral antibiotics on board, they will settle and then they will start to clear. But that's, that's usually the biggest issue. And if they don't, then they'll go back to using the steroid and the cycle continues. Interesting. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, can, um, do you have any strategies around minimizing the impact of prolonged mask use? It's a big one, I guess, for having to use lots of masks at the moment in healthcare, so. Well, so what I find with prolonged mask use is that you, they, you need to make sure that they are taking as good care of their skin as possible. Um, and then I find that if they can use barrier creams, so zinc containing barrier creams underneath their mask, it, that can help um, and definitely minimize the amount of makeup or occlusive agents that they're using underneath. If they're able to take a break during a shift, wash their face, kind of reset the clock and then reapply the barrier creams, I find that that's really helpful too. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, someone just wanted you to touch on the, the side effects of isotretinoin and the possible psychiatric changes. And I just thought it'd be quite a useful one to talk about because I know this is a big fear for a lot of people using isotretinoin. Mm. Um, can you just touch on that a little bit for us? So um, it, it is a possible side effect. And so we always bring up, we always bring it up initially. Uh, but at the end of the day, you will not be able to predict who is going to develop depression or suicidal ideations um, with isotretinoin. And so you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and so um, I just let patients know if they have a pre-existing mood disorder, if they're on an antidepressant, then I have to have the GP on board or whoever prescribed the antidepressants on board. Mm -hmm. And they have to be co-managing the patient's symptoms along with me. Okay. Um, if they don't have a family history and they don't have active mood disorder, 
then we just let them know that, look, it is a possibility. And if they're not engaging in the activities that they would normally engage in, or if the parent notices that there's a change in their, in their child, then they stop the medication. There's absolutely no harm in stopping it from one day to the next, ringing your um, physician and then having the conversation. But fear of depression alone should not be a reason to treat with isotretinoin. We have in exactly com conflicting studies, 13,000 patients um, on isotretinoin where there was no increased risk of depression. And then two years later, another study that said, well, actually maybe there's a slightly increased risk. So the data doesn't help us, it's case yeah. by case. Okay, awesome. I think that's really useful, thank you. Um, with, um, you've got lots of requests uh, on, on which specific moisturizers and cleansers and things like that you would recommend for gentle uh, ones. So we'll touch on that shortly, but I think we'll just try and get through as many as we can before we start talking about different products, if that's all right. So can ocular rosacea and uh, occur in isolation or does it always accompany skin rosacea? If ocular rosacea is occurring in isolation, then that is a diagnosis that has to be made by the ophthalmologist. Okay. Because you as a clinician, unless you have the equipment, won't be able to make the connection. Okay. So I would just say refer. Awesome. Um, and can you touch briefly on rhinophyma treatments? Yeah, so um, I think when you get to the rhinophyma, oral antibiotics can help suppress. I think lasers are very helpful. So either V-beam laser or the fractionated lasers that can kind of, um, you're just sort of ablating that, that exuberant skin and then allowing for um, a more scarred skin to develop, but that's preferable to the rhinophyma. Mm -hmm. um, or um, you need chronic low-dose isotretinoin. Okay. Okay. And um, in terms, of, we've talked a bit about, I guess, topical and oral things like that. Supplementation. Um, someone's made a comment here just about um, in Korea, they promote quite a lot of oral intake of supplements um, to help with ceramide reformation. Do you know if there's any evidence around that? Yeah, so I think that there is some evidence for um, omega 3s. Um, there's quite a bit of. Um, sort of support for zinc supplementation. Um, I think if, if zinc levels are low, then by all means supplement. But if your levels are normal, then it's much harder to make that connection. Um, the other thing to be careful of is that patients will often come in on a vitamin A supplement. And so you want to know exactly what they're using before you put them on isotretinoin. Yeah. Okay. Just make sure you have a good history of what they're already on. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, and what is your typical hierarchy of topical acne treatments? So be, because I'm a dermatologist, I'm not going to see your entry level acne. Um, yeah. And so the patients that come and see me have already tried and failed topical salicylic acid. They failed benzoyl peroxide. Um, some have failed salicylic acid in every single ingredient that they were using. Um, they have um, failed in some cases failed topical retinoids, but what I find is that they were using them incorrectly. Yeah. And so what I'm seeing is really that moderate to severe acne that we're now discussing oral treatment for, or we're discussing laser treatment for, or in some cases, you know, going beyond to isotretinoin. Okay, so for those mild cases that we will be seeing in primary practice and, and hopefully getting sorted, what would you recommend as your? So you, you now have the advantage of having whole skincare lines mm -hmm. that have been developed for these patients. Yeah. And so you don't even have to engage all that much. You could just let them know, you know, these are the brands yeah. that offer you this. And, and, and what I find is the patients already know that when you say the brand, Oh yeah, yeah. I've heard of them. Uh -huh. So there's, there's already a moisturizer. There's already a cleanser. There's already a moisturizer. And then it'll have an active ingredient. Usually it's salicylic acid. Okay. Or it'll be a benzoyl peroxide. And so you just have them try that. It's all over the counter. That should be your first line, especially if they're only comedonal. And then if that works, great, they won't come back. If it doesn't, it means that they've progressed. And at that point, you need to prescribe a, a topical retinoid at the very least. Okay. Great of that. But then if you prescribe a topical retinoid, you need to remove the active ingredient. So if they were using a topical salicylic acid, you have to stop that. 
and yeah. saying, no, let my prescription drug do all the work. You're just going to wash with a mild cleanser and you're going to hydrate and you're going to use sunscreen. Okay. Well, so this will be the perfect time then to ask what brands would you recommend? What, what do you think are safe for us to recommend in practice? Number one for the active ingredients, but then for the gentle stuff when we want them to stop using that. Do you have different lines that you would recommend? No. Here's a secret. And this is what is all the revolution. Okay. <laughs> 20 years ago, we realized that there was um, a phylagrin mutation and the phylagrin caused eczema. And so what happened? Uh, the the big pharma was really smart and said, okay, well, let's let's improve this barrier. And so they started developing products that are now all available in New Zealand as over-the-counter products with active ingredients to repair the skin barrier. They added ceramides. That's the key. Everything I've been talking about today, those ceramides have been added to their treatment regimens. Okay. So basically any eczema line that you are comfortable with, Avino, Cetaphil, the La Roche products. So you've got um, CeraVe, you have Effaclair, you have Tolerain, you have Aven, you have, the list goes on. But basically in this eczema family, these lines have now all developed acne lines because we know that at the root of all this is a skin barrier dysfunction. And this is why they're so effective because on the one hand, you're going to irritate the skin with an acne product, but you have the backup and the support of the skin barrier repair from that eczema line and from, from that eczema research and that eczema data, okay? The big distinction though to make is that you don't want your patients using a heavy oil-based moisturizer that they have used for years on their eczema on their face if they have acne. This is when they need to switch and they need to use water-based moisturizers so say that they've been using CeraVe, they need to use the CeraVe Acne, or if they've been using the La Roche products, they need to use the Acne line. And they will all make that dis distinction. Um, yeah. As long as it has ceramides, they're, they're going to be fine. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Perfect. That has answered about 10, 10 people's questions. <laughs> um, with bleach baths, how long would you bleach bath for and what temperatures and can you submerge the face to address the face and neck? Yes, because when you make a bleach bath, it's no different than when they go to the aquatic center and they're submerged, they're, their face is going under the water. So, um, yeah, look, I wish there was an easy answer for this. There isn't. If they're flared, then I would say bleach baths every other day um, once they're better. Uh, some patients respond really well to bleach baths. And if that's the case, then, and they, and they embrace it, then I say minimum one to two times a week. Awesome. Some patients yeah. don't care for it. And then you're trying to compensate and find ways around it, but it's the art of medicine there. Thank you. And, and when would you recommend allergy testing in atopic eczema? Do we have another three hours? I know I am I am jumping around a little bit in terms of your topics as well I do apologize there's just so many questions so I'm doing my best <laughs> but yes if you can so, gently touch on that <laughs> yeah I mean I, I I think if if you're not you know for those that are in primary care mm. if you've managed your patient appropriately mm. with the standard of care and you are certain that they have adhered to the treatment and they're not getting better then they need to be referred. If you don't have that luxury to be able to refer, mm -hmm. then I, I think a good history, if you can find triggers that are relevant, they are worth going after. And I mean, using my words really cautiously here, because the truth is there's a lot of over-testing that's, that's going on. And then, you know, you find patients trying to scramble to say, how is it that my one plus wheat allergy is contributing to my full body eczema? I must then eliminate all wheat. And that's a very hard stretch, you know, and, 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 and case to make. But if you have a patient, and I have seen this, I've seen this over and over again, um, I'll give you a little story. So this was my children's preschool in the US and um, every spring there was a big oak tree in the back uh, in the playground. And every year as that oak tree was flowering, mm -hmm. I would then see the patients come in with a perioral dermatitis. And these were eczema patients that were doing quite well, but for some reason, all of a sudden, flare. 
And I had the luxury of knowing where they went to school, that there was an oak tree that happened to be flowering. And these were children that did have a history of eczema and seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a correlation. If you have a pollen allergy and it's pollen season and you're outside, that eyelid skin is so thin that it can cause a dermatitis. So that's the best example that I can give you where, you know, an IgE mediated allergy can mm -hmm. lead to eczema. Now, what is the treatment? Yes, if I gave them hydrocortisone, I can make it better. But the minute they stop, that oak tree is still flowering, the eczema comes right back. That's why I'm saying treating is easy. Maintaining is where it's difficult. But if you start patients on oral antihistamines and you start them before the oak tree flowers, Mm -hmm. and you have those antihistamines on board on a daily basis, you then prevent the eyelid dermatitis. Mm -hmm. And I was able to follow these children long enough to, to see that happen. So there's a lot there. You have to convince your patients that their seasonal allergies are real. You have to convince them that they need to be on antihistamines before they have symptoms. Um, and that yes, hopefully next year, we can prevent their eyelid dermatitis. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, once the dermatitis has set in and they've used every single product imaginable, then you have to treat the dermatitis, the skin barrier dysfunction, the infection that they get on top of that, and then you hopefully can maintain it. So, Interesting. And what a beautiful example. <laughs> um, and when would you use your um, um, Pima, oh my gosh, Tecrolimus and your um, Pima Colimus? Oh, I said that wrong, sorry. <laughs> In the US where we didn't have a restriction on the amount of drug that was available to patients, we would use it on the face and on the body in the same way, which was you treat with a topical steroid to treat the acute flare, and then you maintain with the calcineurin inhibitors. And right. you bring them in early sort of thing, really, after the initial treatment. Just yeah. as you're clearing. Yeah. yeah. On the face, I would bring them in at about day five. On the body, maybe about day seven to 10. Okay. Um, and then you'd use, you could use, so then you would replace the steroid with the calcineurin inhibitor, and you can do that for a week. So that's pretty simple, right? Steroid for a week, calcineurin inhibitor for a week, and then you go to maintenance. And what maintenance looks like is two or three times a week mm -hmm. to normal skin. Yeah. Okay. And that, that lengthens the flare interval. Okay, awesome. And you can continuously do that. You don't, there's not like, you don't have to worry about overuse of the medication on the skin. Well, it does not cause the same side. It doesn't cause side effects the way steroids cause side effects yeah. because their, um, their mechanism of action is so much more precise. So you don't have the atrophy. You don't have the risk of stria. You don't have the risk of cataracts. So yes, they can be safely used longer term, but really what happens is patients then they, they do so well that they forget to use it and yeah. then flare again and then they'll come back on. And that's okay. I mean, that's yeah. sort of what you're trying to achieve. Um, perfect. And um, in terms of oral antibiotics for rosacea, I mean, how long can someone be on the oral antibiotic course for? Is, is it an aim to come off it? Hopefully, obviously, the, the rosacea yeah, goes yeah, away. But... Um, yeah, all my patients come off. Um, I, I, my goal is six months. Okay. But it's not really fair because I've got other things that I can play with. So the V-beam laser is amazing at this. So I have other little tricks that I can use to help them come off. Um, but I would say if, if you have a rosacea patient, it's been more than six months and you can't get them off, maybe a referral because there could be more that you can do or consider putting them on low dose isotretinoin okay. and then keeping them on that. I think that's safer long-term than, than the antibiotics. Okay. Awesome. Um, we've, we've, um, got one minute left, so let's try and, um, get something else in. So, um, what is an example of a keratolytic for keratosis pilaris for a child? So it's salicylic acid, but you're going to use it in the 0.45%. And so this is a, a product that's only available in the CeraVe line. And so it's called CeraVe SA, and it's a mm -hmm. cleanser and a cream. Okay. And then you, you just either use the cleanser, you just use the cream, or you could use both depending on how severe the condition is. Okay, awesome. Um, and... What could be a different approach for hand eczema that is chronic? So the role of allergy sensitivity testing would 
I mean, we sort of touched basically on that, that it was, that's a whole other topic that we might actually maybe do a webinar on <laughs> and get you back. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we but, could do a, we could do a whole topic on hand dermatitis. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Again, it's another one that is easy to treat, hard to manage, yeah. <clears throat> but if they're not responding, then those patients at the very least need patch testing, which is a completely different form of testing mm -hmm. than your traditional um, RAST or prick testing. Um, and one final question, um, just touching slightly on seborrheic dermatitis, because I don't think we've got a chance to, to hear about that from you tonight. Would you just be able to give a, a quick, um, quick, quick management? You're like, no. <laughs> um, well, so it, it's, um, it's yeast mediated. Um, it probably is a dysbiosis. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of alluded to it before because we talked about inner trigo. Mm -hmm. um, and seborrhea is really inner trigo, but involving the face, the hair bearing areas. Yeah. Um, it is more common in, in adult men, whereas rosacea more common in adult women. I think seborrhea, either um, toddlers, adolescents, and then adult men. Um, I, I still use quite a bit of um, myconazole. Uh, yeah. And then I might use a cleanser. Um, there's an Epiclair product, an isobiome. Uh, product that helps with um, the skin microbiome. So I'll have them on, on that cleanser. Sometimes they alternate that with Sebazol shampoo and I have them use it on their scalp and the face because oftentimes the seborrhea comes with dandruff. So they have to treat the scalp if you want to make the face better. So they'll use that. Um, uh, and then topical myconazole. If you have to, you can try some pimacrolimus. It won't be subsidized, but you can try some pimacrolimus if, if they're really red and flared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to present tonight, Lisa. It was really interesting, as I said before, and I'm, as I said, I probably will be watching it a few times. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. And that's it from us tonight. Have a lovely night, everyone. Ka kite.